Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Father Kevin Duggan. I'm the pastor here at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. And on behalf of our entire parish and staff, I want to welcome you and thank you for being here. We also stand, extend a warm welcome to the candidates here who will be speaking with you and responding to your questions. We're so pleased to have all of you here, and we are confident that the evening will be both enjoyable as well as engaging. So once again, thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see so many people who have turned out. And I want to turn it over now to Brian Callanan. How about first this? Lucy, why don't you come up here with the League of Women Voters? Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Lucy Gaskell Gaddis, and I do represent the League of Women Voters. We, along with uh, the West Side Interfaith Network and the High Point Mosque, are also co sponsoring this with OLG. And as you know, the League is uh, focused on voter education, so we're happy that you're here tonight so that you can make an informed uh, decision when you actually get to your ballots. Also, the other thing the League does is to register voters. So you'll notice that there's Reese Hutchison over there. There's a voter registration table. We have voter um, information in five different languages. And just to remind you, if any of you are 16 or over, you can register. You can also register online or by mail um, by uh, October 25th. And Reese has these little things that you can hand out that makes it easier for you to, to vote by mail or to go online and do it online. Um, the candidates will first answer questions that the committee has, has created, and then there's an opportunity for you to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and someone will give you a, a note card, and then we'll uh, pick it up. We hope that we'll be able to answer most of the questions, and we do have some people who will be trying to sift through to find questions that get to things that have not been talked about. Um, we also ask you not to applaud or to show support for any of the candidates until the end of the forum. We are very fortunate to have Brian Callahan as our moderator. Brian is a five-time Emmy Award winner who currently serves as the television show host on Seattle Channel. And um, he, he has worked there since for, for quite a while. <laughs> He's a 25-year veteran of the broadcast journalism, including a stint with Q13 Fox. Brian was the Seattle Municipal League Civic Award winner for government news reporting in 2016. Brian is also a West Seattle resident, and so it's very fortunate we have him. Brian? Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, League of Women Voters. Uh, Brian Callanan here. I am a host on Seattle Channel. I am not here in that capacity tonight. My family has been going to church here at Our Lady of Guadalupe for about the past 20 years. That's an honor for me to be here and very glad to be with the candidates. We're looking forward to a good civil debate tonight. And we thank, for, thank everybody for taking part in this in person or if you're streaming, watching this on our live stream, we appreciate that too. I should make sure that as we're, as we're here tonight, I appreciate everybody staying as socially distanced as possible within your different family groups. That's important. Um, thanks for spreading out as you've done. This is a great turnout, so let's make sure we respect each other's space as we get through and keep your masks on during the event as well. Uh, I know that we said no more shouting or clapping throughout the event, but I'm going to try it one more time if you could. I wanted to introduce the candidates and thank them for running. For position eight, the incumbent is Teresa Mosqueda. Her challenger is Kenneth Wilson. And over here in position nine, the candidates are Nikita Oliver and Sarah Nelson. So what we'll do is this. We're going to have opening statements from each candidate for about a minute and a half, and I'll do a coin flip to see who speaks first. Whoever goes first will not have the last word at the end of the forum. Candidates will have a minute and a half to answer a number of questions that, as Lucy mentioned, were developed by the committee, and we'd like to have all the can candidates answer these questions. Over the course of the evening, I'll offer each candidate four one-minute rebuttals. I may ask some follow-ups along the way just to make sure a question is answered. We have a timer up front. Vince is helping us out here. That'll help our candidates know how much time they have left. If you want to use a little less time, that's fine. We're trying to cover some ground here, and I appreciate your help. Also, if you want to follow up on anything you hear tonight, you're in the audience, ask a librarian. We actually have a table right over here in the corner. This is help from the Washington State Libraries and Seattle Public Libraries working together on this. 
If there's anything you have a question about, you want to connect to some resources, your librarians can help you out. If you're looking at this online, look in the comments section and you'll find some more information about your librarians there. So I appreciate their help, appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I'm going to start with position eight. Uh, how about this? Teresa, call it in the air. Heads. It is heads. Would you like to speak first or second? I'll, I'll speak first. Okay, great. Uh, why don't you go right ahead? A minute and a half. Okay, well, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Thank you to the first nerds at the Lady of Guadalupe who are here tonight. Thank you very much to Father Duggan for um, hosting us and to the League of Women Voters. It's wonderful to be back in your presence again. Uh, folks may know me from the work that we've done together over the last four years on Seattle City Council for our work to expand access to affordable housing, to triple investments in first-time home buyer opportunities, in making sure that we have tiny houses like the ones at Second Chance that I had that folks, the chance to speak with folks about just before this forum, to make sure that there's housing for those as we build affordable housing. We've invested in worker protections and we've invested in small businesses, especially in this time. But before my time on council, I worked with the League of Women Voters and I worked with broad faith groups through the Faith Action Network in my time at the Washington State Labor Council for almost eight years and before that with the Children's Alliance where we expanded access to health care for all kiddos. We implemented the Affordable Care Act. We made sure that we were creating more opportunity for foster kids and we worked together to create opportunities for folks to have a place to call home. I come to you as someone who has spent almost 15 to 20 years working to build coalitions, to tackle really tough problems, to bring people to the table, and to find solutions. And I'm asking for your support again as we emerge out of COVID to have someone like me in this seat who can continue to find progressive pathways forward to unite us and to create a more equitable Seattle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kenneth, you're next, please. Minute and a half. No, no applause, please. Thanks. Thanks very much. I am, I am Kenneth Wilson. I'm running for your council aid position. And um, sorry if I can't see you very well. If I have the glasses on, they fog and I get nothing. So um, with a mask, that's how it goes. But I did drive here and um, I sat in all that traffic, same as you have done now for 21 months. And so what I'm about is I am a bridge engineer, but I'm an engineer, someone that solves hard and difficult problems. I'm a business owner since 2005. And I'm here to do something different. This, this city is in a really hard spot. These are some of the worst safety issues we have seen in memory. This council can find solutions for our increased homeless. More money, more money, and still it's worse. So with failed roads, that bridge is closed now still. And I sat in the traffic same as you do every day. Our businesses are challenged. Downtown, we're having problems with safety issues. Who's going to defend the tip jar? We have problems with police and keeping the good staff that we need. How do we keep and retain this good staff? So I'm here to make that big difference. I'm here to make a change and give you guys this opportunity to now say with your voice that you want accountability. That's what I do as an engineer. Every one of these bridges I do, you drive across and I am accountable to you. So that's what I'm going to bring to this Seattle Council. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. We're going to position nine now. Uh, Sarah, call it in the air. Thanks. It's heads. Uh, Nikita, would you like to talk first or second? I will go first. OK, go right ahead. Well, good evening. My name is Nikita Oliver. I use they, them pronouns. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share space with you today. My early work in Seattle was doing uh, partnerships with interfaith organizations and working for the Christian Community Development Association, Urban Impact, to develop pipelines out of the school to prison pipeline for young people to thrive. I believe that our budget is a moral document. It says who and what we value, and we need a city council who will prioritize our most vulnerable and marginalized Seattleites. I've served on the front lines of the crises that we are facing as an executive director of an innovative organization that I've been able to take from 200,000 a year to a million, hiring many people in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that people have access to jobs and opportunity. I believe that as a city, we have to commit ourselves to green social affordable housing for all, public health systems and safety systems that prioritize getting to root causes and an intentional effort to address the racial wealth gap, provide transportation for all that is connecting our entire city, protect our urban tree canopy, and fight back on the climate catastrophe that is upon us. 
I believe we do that by building broad coalitions. I am endorsed by Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, King County Council Member Girma Zahalai, Teresa Mosqueda, and Temi Morales, as well as every environmental organization that is endorsed in this race and MLK Labor Council showing that I can bring together a broad coalition of community members to address these crises. Thank you very much. Sarah, go ahead. Hello, thank you very much. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Father Duggan, for making this possible. League of Women Voters and the Knights of Columbus for seating us. All right. My name is Sarah Nelson, and I am a lifelong Democrat, a mother of two teenage boys, and I moved to Seattle in 1990 to get a degree in anthropology and my PhD. And I left academia to, uh, to have a more direct impact in public service. So I took a job in Councilmember Richard Conlin's office where I worked for about a year. And um, I learned that good policy is made not by starting with an agenda, but by listening to people, bringing people together and paying attention to detail. I also own Fremont Brewing with my husband and um, I am concerned about the neighborhood business districts that are still boarded up downtown. I look around town at our worsening homelessness crisis at your broken bridge. And I think, what happened? We can do better. And so I'm here to say that if you think things are going well in Seattle right now, I'm probably not your candidate because I'm running a change campaign to restore public trust in local government through accountable, pragmatic, and progressive leadership. And thank you very much for being engaged in this election and listening to this discussion tonight. Thank you. We're going to start with some questions here, and I'm going to switch up the order just a little bit. I'm going to start talking about homelessness, and we'll begin with uh, position eight over here. And Kenneth, I'll start with you here. These are some of the questions that have been developed by the League of Women Voters and the High Point Mosque and the group that got together for this. I should say, if you have a question, you'd like to write one down and have the candidates answer it, we're going to try to make that happen. So raise your hand, and we'll make sure we get you a card, and we'll have those towards the end of the evening here. We'll be here till about 8.30. So Kenneth, the question to you is as follows. Tell us about your approach to homelessness if you're elected, how you would increase the amount of shelter space and affordable housing in Seattle, how you would pay for that, and also explain your position on keeping public spaces clear of encampments. A minute and a half, if you could. Oh, thanks very much. Um, good question, and we have been talking and reviewing this so much these days. And so most, most importantly for me is about following the law and making sure that we don't have unsanctioned encampments. But these are actually really people that have real feelings and real needs. They are in the consequence of a really heavy challenge and it's up to us to take away those consequences and make it so that they can transition and build out. What I want to do is actually build a real transition facility where we can give people these opportunities to build a life and give them the time that they need to actually within a real facility, not just something that's gonna be a tiny home that's temporary and not really a home at all. Give them some facility that's actual, real, and gonna build that transition, something that will give them job training and the social services, get them out of the addictions that we're challenged for. So I talked very specifically on my website about using those big dollars that we're getting right now to build such a facility, something that's an asset for our community. And then these people develop out of that having an assurance that we are actually cared for them and that they are valued as well. So all this investment becomes an investment in them and not wasted dollars. So those are the kind of things that I want to see. Building assets, making a deliverable that these people actually have a path forward and a way to get out of their homeless situation. Thank you very much for that. Teresa Mosqueda, same question here. Your approach to homelessness if you're elected, how would you increase the amount of shelter and affordable housing in Seattle? How would you pay for that? and your position on keeping public spaces clear of encampments. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so as it relates to building housing, we know the solution to helping folks find homes is to create more housing within our city. Jumpstart progressive revenue that I helped lead on last year with large and small businesses, with housing and human service advocates, invest two-thirds of that funding into creating homes. That's $135 million a year that helps to create over 40, excuse me, 4,000 units of permanent affordable housing. Housing is the end game. Housing is the solution to stability. Housing makes sure that our kiddos have a place to learn and that our elders can stay safe, especially right now during COVID. 
And in the meantime, we have put more funding towards uh, temporary solutions, like opening up more hotels and more um, uh, old apartment buildings, acquiring those so that the city owns them and turns them into temporary shelters that are safe during this time of COVID, and frankly, are more appropriate for making sure that people have access to stability, not just a mat on the ground, on the floor, that people have to line up and leave in the, in the morning. We need rooms with doors that people can feel safe. I have helped to open more tiny house villages, and we know that that's a temporary solution. But the truth is, what we need is case managers and mental health counselors and uh, making sure that uh, those job counselors and connectors, folks can actually find people. Moving people from location to location, whether it's in a park or in an RV, is our, what our human service providers say is not actually helping to find solutions. If we move folks, then they can't actually get uh, the connections they need. So I want to make sure that we're okay. connecting folks to housing and services. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I wanted to make sure I let people know if there's a moment, there's a rebuttal needed or whatever else, candidates can signal me and we'll work that in as we go. Just let me know as we, as we go through here. Uh, let's go over to uh, position nine here if I could. And Sarah, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, your approach to homelessness, if you're elected, how would you increase the amount of shelter space, affordable housing in Seattle? How would you pay for that? And your position on keeping public spaces clear of encampments? We've been increasing spending on homelessness every single year and the problem keeps getting worse. We have no plan. And so first of all, we need to stop doing what we're doing and actually put in place a model that prove, that's proven to work in other cities. Best practices in other cities. Now come January 2022, the Regional Homelessness Authority will take the lead on our region-wide uh, homelessness response. And that's a good thing and elements of their implementation plan are things that I've been calling for all along. Uh, a, um, we have to know the individuals that are unsheltered and their specific needs to be able to provide continuity of care. So they're developing a by name list. We need to have coordination amongst service providers. Um, and you know, I was reading about um, Camp Second Chance here. So some of you know that sometimes there can be a disconnect between housing and the services that are provided. And we need, finally, to directly fund mental health and substance abuse treatment. That is a big, gaping hole in our, in our response. And, and I am concerned that ignoring encampments and people falling deeper into addiction in encampments, because addiction is both a driver and a consequence of homelessness, is making the problem worse. So we've got to saturate areas of our city with resources, get people into homes with a housing first model, and restore our parks and open spaces uh, for everyone to use. Okay, thank you very much for that. Nikita, you heard the question a couple of times now, but your approach to homelessness, if you're elected, how would you increase the amount of shelter space, affordable housing, how would you pay for that, and your position on public spaces and encampments, please. So we know that based on the Chamber's research that in order to get out of the housing affordability and homelessness crisis, we need about $400 million per year for the next 10 years. The Jumpstart tax is a good uh, step in that right direction, but we have seven other progressive revenue generating options that our own tax force has identified that we can leverage both to meet that 400 million a year, as well as build out our own behavioral health system so we are no longer dependent upon the King County system that is based on your property taxes and the sales tax that we pay. Additionally, we need short-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions. In the long term, we need to be building deeply affordable housing, both workforce housing, 30 to 60% AMI, and zero to 30% for our lowest income residents. A part of that's going to be also acquisition. We just spent $50 million in partnership with the state. They chipped in $50 million to buy three buildings that will now provide a little over 150 units, specifically for our residents that are living outside. We can continue building and doing acquisition, but in the midterm and short term, we need to be providing adequate bridge housing and supportive housing, as well as rather than sweeping our relatives who are living outside, providing radical accessibility. There are already dollars that exist in the budget that are intentioned for sweeps. Instead, we provide hygiene, sanitation, cleanup, peer navigators and case managers to ensure that those folks can be found, moved into housing when it becomes available, because the problem with sweeps is they get lost. So keeping them in place, providing them with support to stay clean and healthy, and providing that peer navigator support, we can immediately get people housed. Thank you. Sarah's asked for a rebuttal here. Please do what you gotta do. Uh, get a little closer on that mic. I wanna make okay. sure people are hearing you at home. A lot of times people talk about how much money it will make it will take to build all of these this housing but what are we going to do before then just wait we do have to address encampments 
And, um, and my opponent's call for radical accessibility means creating a fund in the parks department to help people continue living in parks. I think that that is a misuse of limited resources. I think that we need to spend all of our money on actual housing. And in the meantime, really outreach and, and make sure that people know what their options are. We need a real-time list of options that are available right now so that when we approach people living in encampments and, and we can offer something that they can go to right away. Brian? And Please, and yeah. If First you're finished, all, yes. Yeah. I'd like to say that's disingenuous. What I said is, within the budget, we've actually already allocated within three departments specifically, including Seattle Parks and Rec, dollars specified for sweeps. Rather than using those to sweep people around the city, we actually leverage them for hygiene, sanitation, the things we know can keep spaces clean. And then we place peer navigators and case managers in those spaces to ensure that people then can transition into housing. When we sweep them, what I've heard from case managers is they get lost. Housing comes up and now we can no longer find them to move them from outside into spaces. If we really want our parks accessible and clean, allowing folks to remain in a place where we can find them with the resources for everyone to be safer and healthier and more hygienic then means that when that housing comes online or those short-term options like tiny house villages or non-congregate shelters, we can immediately move people inside because we know exactly where to find them. Okay, it looks like there are some other people who wanted to tag in here. Uh, Teresa, you had something else to say? Let's give it a minute, please. Thank you very much. Uh, there's something that we need to remember. The folks who are living outside, so many folks that are unsheltered are families. We have the highest rates of numbers of kiddos, like my kiddo who just showed us here, Camila and my husband have joined us here tonight, families who are sleeping in their cars. Half of Seattle's homeless population is living in vehicles. Last year in our budget and this year in the Seattle Rescue Plan, I put funding forward for more safe lots, like the one that's run up at the University Heights and the safe lots that are around our cities and up and down the West Coast that we have seen be so incredibly successful. We need to have access to places where case managers can go to help individuals get into housing, not move them around. And the concept of having 150 people live in one place directly from those who work at the Downtown Emergency Services Center has said that that's not a winning formula for folks who have high barriers your needs. We need to have places for those who need mental health counseling, case management, to have the ability to have their needs met in a holistic way. And that means opening up some places around the city that, um, that house 20 to 40 folks at a time. And we do have a plan. It is the Regional Homelessness Authority, and I'm working hard on it. Thank you for that. Kenneth, it looks like you want to weigh in. Give it a minute. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And so I think it's fundamental that you think about what you just heard. This is your council member telling you that, yes, there's no beds for the last four years. Yes, they are putting more money into this system with no results. So that's what I'm here about, is that we're actually having, is, if that is their plan, and this plan is not working, is it time to give them more dollars to continue the worthless plan? That's not what needs to happen. We actually have to make real transitions and build these people out of their problems. And they're also doing other things that are really unusual. You get this windfall of a huge amount of money from the federal level, and now you're going to buy up empty hotels? Do, do you really want to help this region, or do you want to help the investors just run away from it? We should be building a facility right now. These are jobs. These are people. This is our money. Let's do something real. Let's make a plan that actually gets us out of this, not continue the same one. Uh, Thanks for Teresa, I can throw another rebuttal your way. Looks like you wanted to say something. Thank you so much. Well, the data shows that when people have a place to call home, especially in tiny houses, they are 47% more likely to get placed into housing. They're creating a stable place for people where case managers know to reach them and can get them into housing when it opens. We have seen our population increase in Seattle over the last 10 years by 21%. And we haven't been able to build the affordable housing, the housing in general, frankly, that we need for our entire population, for working families, for our elders, for those who are moving here. Folks are gonna continue to move here. This is a place where we have great jobs, entrepreneurs, we have the opportunity for um, economic refugees, for climate refugees, for immigrants and refugees, but we must build the affordable housing needed. There is absolutely a connection with our increase in population and the fact that we haven't built enough affordable housing as fast as we need to. In my time on council, I've tripled that investment in first-time home ownership options. We are working towards creating more inclusive zoning, okay. and with your support, we can do more to house folks. 
Thank you. We're going to try to cover some other topics here, but a good conversation about homelessness, as we should have. We're going to talk about climate change, and I'll work over to uh, position nine. Uh, and how about I'll start with you, Nikita. Uh, the city of Seattle has a goal to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. What are the impacts of climate change you are seeing in the city, and how would you respond to them if elected? And also, how are we going to reach that 2050 goal of carbon neutrality? Yeah, you know, so there are multiple things that we need to be doing as we approach our 2024 comprehensive plan, ending the apartment ban and, and really getting out of exclusionary zoning will be key to building effective density throughout the city so we can stop urban sprawl, which is effectively killing our urban tree canopy. Second, we need to continue to invest in rapid, affordable, connected transit throughout the entirety of our city so that people can get throughout the city without having to drive in single occupancy vehicles, which is our number one contributor to carbon emissions within the city. Uh, thirdly, really investing in a Green New Deal and building out a green workforce in partnership with IBEW 46, IBEW 77, and I'm honored to be endorsed by the business manager of IBEW 46, Sean Bagsby, because we've been working together on building pipelines into the green workforce, into the green economy, specifically for black and brown youth who are currently involved in the street economy. There are a lot of ways, uh, additionally, as we build our housing to be building green buildings, green, social, affordable housing that prioritizes instead of continuing with uh, natural gas hookups, that we build the type of housing that moves us into the next century because reality is the second fastest growing carbon emitter in our city is buildings. So doing these things together in addition to expanding our electrical grid to be able to meet the capacity needed will help us achieve our climate goals as we move forward. Thanks very much for that. Sarah, I'll ask you the same question. The impacts of climate change that you're seeing in the city of Seattle, how would you respond to them if elected and how do we reach this 2050 goal of carbon neutrality? I agree with most of what Nikita said. It's about housing and transit and, and uh, ending the, the dependence on fossil fuels. And I've been working with the Blue Green Alliance, which is a coalition of labor and environmentalists that are putting forth um, policies that can be implemented at the state and the city. That's all a good thing. And I, I, um, but I will say this. We're not gonna reach our carbon neutrality goals until we engage the business community. We can't buy enough you know, electric vehicles, build enough um, you know, green buildings or, or um, living buildings. We have got to get the private sector to step up. And at Fremont Brewing, we've gone the mile to, in, to get the green technology and we've promoted it and, and you know, uh, heat exchangers, et cetera. But, who better to engage than a small business owner? We need to mend a little bit the, the relationship with our business community because that's where change is gonna happen. If we don't address the private sector and, and incentivize changes in operations, procurement, we're not gonna make it. And so seriously, we have to do all of what Nikita said and reach out and get the private sector to step up. Okay, thank you very much for that. Move on to position eight here. Teresa, why don't I have you start on this? The impacts of climate change you're seeing in the city, how you'd respond to them if you were reelected, and how do we reach this 2050 goal of carbon neutrality? Thank you so much. So first, it's not too late to reach our goal by 2050 to reach carbon neutrality. In fact, we have an indicator that we need to reach in the very near future. In 2030, we want to have reduced our carbon footprint by 58%. We can do that. Here's some of the things that I've done, and here's the things that I want to continue to do with your support. We can fight for more affordable housing and housing in general in our city and require setbacks so there's greater tree canopy and ability to have green space across our city, especially in communities that are seeing higher rates of development. We want to create setbacks, green roofs, the opportunity to plant trees also on public land. That is something that we can do. Those two issues go hand in hand because when we build in our city, it reduces the need for folks to commute in hours from our out Outlying cities. We are the third highest mega commuter city in the entire country, but we can do that by creating greater tree canopy and building at the same time. The second thing, the first year that I was in office, we passed legislation to improve energy efficiency standards for city buildings. I want to take that legislation and apply it to all buildings across Seattle, just like they did in New York City. It took them about six years to pass that legislation, but I think we can do it now, knowing the fact uh, we, we accomplished together with business and labor to get energy efficiency standards. And in housing, finally, 
We have done incredible work so far, and I'm going to scale up the investments to weatherize older homes to make it possible for people to stay in their homes, have more affordable utilities, and to be able to create long-term stability okay. in those housing while we also make sure it's easier to expedite building green homes. Thank you. Kenneth, uh, your thoughts on this, the impacts of climate change you're seeing, how would you respond to them if elected, and how would Seattle reach the 2050 goal of carbon neutrality? Absolutely. Um, great question and very important to us all. Most importantly, you have to know that we are making great strides. Even if you look about the efficiency of the vehicles we have, the changes that we're doing even with sound transit to bring our, um, our, our light rail up online and all these valuable facilities, the bus systems that are now changed to natural gas and electric, all of these are great steps. I will not take apart our society but I will help build to a better way that we get here. The main thing is about carbon neutrality. You look at the carbon footprint that's built into every structure that's in front of us. And so all these ideas about, well, we'll tear this down and do something better, that's not getting you there. What has to happen is think about the efficiency of what's already built into our ex existing facilities. Make big changes on those vehicles and challenges that we can make big changes at. Everything that's built new, build with that new green idea. These are the ways that we actually progress forward, and you have to know that we are already progressing forward. Back to trees. Our critical green canopy is getting taken down every time they're redeveloping. We're upzoning everything, and guess what? Step one. You've seen it around the city, right? Step one take down all the trees. So it's up to us about not just saying the sayings, but actually doing it, protecting our trees now. This has been in front of the council for years, and it's our time to now do something. Thank you very much for that. Uh, was there something you wanted to add? Okay. Um, so I have the opportunity to live here in West Seattle with many of you. We have the opportunity to live in West Seattle because one plot of land was turned into four homes. I live in a neighborhood that's dense. There's neighbors around me that are seniors and kiddos, and we've had the chance, especially in COVID, to walk around and meet more people. These new places for folks to live, in addition to the older homes that are there, can be built by protecting trees and creating greater density. The same thing is true in South Park, for example where I went last weekend and I saw 13 new homes where one older, smaller home used to stand. 13 homes for first-time home buyers all around large old growth trees where elders can sit underneath, where kiddos can play. That is a great example of the both and approach. Building housing while protecting trees. We can do this. We have done it on council and with your support, I'll continue to fight for both a density along with the green canopy and other setbacks to create green spaces so that kiddos and elders can have places to go. Okay, thank you very much for that. I have you at uh, three of your rebuttals so far. You got one more oh, in the tank. No. We'll okay, keep it going, we'll keep it going. Don't, don't even, we'll, we'll, we'll get you covered here. Okay, uh, I you. wanted to move on to, uh, let me go ahead to position nine on this one to ask a question about traffic and transportation. And Sarah, let me start with you. West Seattle commuters and businesses have been hit hard by the closure of the West Seattle Bridge. What solutions can you provide in terms of easing traffic congestion in the short term and looking towards long-term transit solutions like light rail or even a gondola project? Gosh, it seems like just yesterday that I was working in Richard Conlon's office and we were planning the alignment for Sound Transit 2 and, uh, and planning the stations for that alignment. And now it has come to fruition. So it seems that... Um, uh, waiting for the, the, the line to come to West Seattle is going to be a long haul, but I am committed to ensuring that that project is built within budget and that we can um, expedite that project by expediting the permitting system. We have got to make sure that that project is built well and that you are listened to. Because I'm hearing that there's not great planning going on between the city and Sound Transit staff when it comes to advancing preferred alternatives. So that is a big issue. Now when it comes to um, transit buses, uh, that is a, you know, there is limited space on our right of way. And so we need to prioritize the mobility of buses. And already the headways of buses have slowed down, even though we have um, past the Transportation Benefit District. And so we need to ensure that buses can travel quickly, and that means infrastructure investments. And that is something that I am unashamedly 
uh, in favor of promoting. I am glad that the council decided to bond off of its vehicle license fee to be able to pay for bridge repair and maintenance because we don't want another West Seattle that's uh, happening again. And Thank you. Too. Thank okay. you. Okay, I appreciate Sorry, it. Sorry, I was looking over That's quite all right. Yep. Uh, Nikita, I'll go to you next on this. West Seattle commuters and businesses hit hard by the closure of the bridge, as you know. Solutions you could provide in terms of easing traffic congestion short term and also long term transit solutions. Your thoughts about that light rail gondola project? Yeah, so short term, I think it's finding ways to better time our freight traffic, the under the bridge traffic, uh, the other pathways in and out of the island, as you all call it. Uh, and timing is really going to be important to this. It's also economically important. We know that many of our freight drivers who back up to go into the port, uh, they work based on load. So that timing is going to be incredibly important for both making sure that you all don't have the longest possible wait and ensuring that they can make the most money that they need to in a day. In the long term, we know that the West Seattle Bridge being repaired is the fastest option to getting you all access back to uh, that primary entrance and exit. That being said, in 40 years, it's probably going to need to be replaced. So in addition to the vehicle licensing fee, which can be leveraged for bridge, road maintenance, and infrastructure, we need to be thinking long-term about actually putting money away now, not just to build another bridge, but what does the sound transit plan, our comprehensive plan, our pedestrian master plan, how do these things all fit together in order to build a city that is able to, one, as we already discussed, meet our climate goals, two, make sure that you can move rapidly, efficiently, and safely throughout the city, regardless whether or not you're biking, driving, walking, or in public transit, and to do what our city has failed to do for honestly 100 years, build a system that is projecting into the next 100 years that makes it so West Seattle never ends up in this position again. Okay, thank you for that. We'll bring this question over to position eight here. Uh, did you have something you wanted to rebut? Okay, uh, do what you gotta do, okay. yeah. One thing I wanted to get to is that um, I want to see the planning right now for this infrastructure dollars that's going to come from the feds. I want to make sure that there is a lot of money planned for expediting this, um, this bridge repair. And where is the port? Has the port stepped up? Because we are talking about shared right of way. And I believe that the port, which has a lot of resources, should be contributing more, and the state. This is a major project, and, um, and we can't go it alone. And so I think that we need to set aside money from the infrastructure uh, dollars that we get. That should go first to expediting the, the repair of West Seattle Bridge. Got it. Thanks. I'll bring this question over here to position eight. Ken, why don't you go first here? Solutions you might be able to provide when it comes to the West Seattle Bridge issues in terms of easing traffic congestion short term, looking towards long term transit solutions like light rail or a gondola project. Yeah. No. Thanks for that. And um, especially to you guys, the main thing I'll, I'll do this graphically three fingers, which is more two lanes of car traffic or three equivalent weight of rails. So this bridge could have been opened a long time ago. We actually finished the main span repairs in November. In December, the contractor's been gone since December. How many of you have driven out there and seen it empty since December? I have, yeah. So this is about actually what can your community get from the city that they're not doing. Just to let you know how this works, standard specification, my project in Redmond, the contractor was late four hours opening their bridge that was impacting 520. Guess how much money they paid WashDOT? $60,000. So imagine you guys, 108,000 vehicles a day are being impacted by city. How much do they owe this community? Your businesses, your people, your access to safety. There's a lot going on here and not having people there paying attention to what's valuable to you and realizing those are trucks that we can't bring on there, but they go on the lower bridge today. The buses go on the lower bridge today. And the idea is about replacement. I just got done talking with you about the Green Deal, right? This is a huge asset. Can you imagine the carbon footprint you're about to throw away? Did they throw away the Brooklyn Bridge? I mean, these ancient structures, okay. and it's very important that we maintain okay. and keep our assets in this city. Thank you, Teresa Mosqueda. This question about the West Seattle Bridge, solutions you could provide in terms of easing traffic congestion in the short term, and also looking towards long-term transit solutions like light rail or a gondola project. Wonderful, well thank you. First, I wanna note how 
Um, we all, on a daily basis, are affected by the bridge closure right now. I live four blocks from the bridge. I live in the North Delridge area there, and my daughter's daycare is right around the corner. Every day, you and I feel this. The folks at Seattle Department of Transportation have been working around the clock to try to help mitigate the impact. 200 projects to help mitigate tra traffic in this time. And I wanna thank them for that work. In addition to the work we're doing to reopen the bridge, it is on time. We are going to open that by mid-year next year. By this time, we will be passing over that bridge. But I will be working in the meantime to continue to increase the frequency of buses like we have done so far and bringing back buses. And I'd love to see the frequency of the water taxi stay at at its um, rates that we see in the summer, and I want to thank Second Dow Constantine, who has endorsed me, for their work to cre keep that water taxi running. That's good for business, and it's good for residents here. The other thing I'd like to do is light the underbelly there of the bridge right now so that more people can park and either walk or bike downtown. That's how I get downtown. It's as a, as a faster way to get downtown, and I've heard from neighbors they'd like to see greater lighting around that area to create more accessibility. And the important thing to note is that when we have things like this that happen, it is important to have a partnership with our federal government and our state government. We've received four, $40 million from the feds, $9 million from the port, $5 million from local partners. I am the candidate that's endorsed by port commissioners and by, state, and by federal representatives and state legislators. And I do have a rebuttal as well to the other comment that was made. Okay, uh, if you want to use that, I have that as your... Last rebuttal of the four we've tried to throw out. There. Well, not actually a rebuttal. I, I do want to add an additional minute because I have your time and you're West Seattle. So I know that contractor that was helping you and was doing a good job post tensioning the system. But I do want to speak very specifically to the activities of your city. So they had, you saw that huge containment system that was out on the span, uh, supposedly a span ready to fall down, right? So they repaired the structure and then they went away and now they're coming back, the same contractor, to repair again. You paid them, all of us paid them to mobilize and do that work. That contractor was on site ready to continue that work and do that exact same thing, post tension the rest of the bridge. So to say that they've done everything they could, to say that they actually have worked for your interest is not true at all. This city had a lot of opportunities to do things better for you for the last 12 months, and they did not. I'm a different kind of council member. There's nine council members there. You need someone technical that's gonna ask okay. these questions and get this done right. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, I have this as, as your last rebuttal if Thank you'd like you. to use it. And this is an important rebuttal because the truth matters. The carbon fiber reinforced concrete that is holding the new tension cables is only in the middle span of the bridge. It is not on the outer spans of the bridge. I have visited that bridge twice. I have met with our state and local leaders. I've met with federal delegation members who are talking about what we can do right now. There are still cracks on the wings of the bridge. It is a um, misguided solution to offer for folks something that doesn't pencil out. SDOT has said if we open just one lane on that bridge right now, it would undo all of the repair work that we have put into place. I know like you, we are frustrated by not being able to get downtown and to our community centers faster, but if we were to open that up, it would undo the very fixes that have been put into place. Folks, we are on schedule, and I want to thank you for all that you've done in this time, but we are going to create a bridge that's going to be repaired. You do not have to be a bridge engineer to know how important it is for us not to undo this incredible work that's been done, and by this time next year, we will be three months into riding that bridge. Okay. Uh, Ken, looks like you want to use your third yeah, rebuttal. Yeah, I do. Ahead. This will be my third rebuttal. Um, because this is so important. So again, yes, I am a bridge structural engineer. I watched at the Western Bridge Engineering Seminar where I presented the Northgate Bridge, the designer of this repair, speak about how they actually repaired the system. I have seen the bridge inspection report that listed the condition one code of those end spans that they were not the, the driver and the problem for this system to state that if you actually make the system lighter, three versus two, that it would have more cracking. It's just ridiculous. And so they're trying to back cover their system that they have, but you can see that Western Bridge Engineering Seminar where the designer said, guess what I designed it for? One load of ash toe load. If you want to read about it, you can read about it in Patrick's blog where he wrote the story in an interview with me and you will get the different details. Okay. Not this Patrick. Sir, Sorry, yes. different point of order. Could you please point out which Patrick? 
Patrick Robinson, I believe. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, quite all right. Let's make sure we get it straight. Uh, we're going to move on to another topic here. Let's see what's happening in, uh, in position nine land, shall we? We're talking about gun safety and gun violence. We had a lot of questions about that. Nikita, let me start with you. The city has seen a spike in gun violence and homicides over the past few months. That has a lot of West Seattleites concerned. How can you ensure the public safety of our residents and what sort of programs or gun control measures do you support? Absolutely, and I'm proud to be the only candidate in this race endorsed by the Alliance for, um, for Gun Safety, Gun Responsibility. I also work very closely with the young people in the neighborhoods who are most impacted by this gun violence. I don't have to come visit at a football game while campaigning. I literally have been to many young people's funerals. Uh, so this is an issue that is at the top of my list because I've also worked on it. I've partnered with Community Passageways, Choose 180, Rainier Beach Action Coalition, Corner Greeters, Be Safe Bros in the South End to provide services at the Safeway parking lot where we saw in a high rate of both violence and gun violence by increasing lighting, by ensuring that we change the way that the road is structured and providing uh, community support in the evening when that violence is most likely to occur, we substantially decreased what was happening in that particular parking lot. We need to invest in those strategies throughout the entirety of the city of Seattle. Last year with community, I advocated for a $4 million investment and the peace and safety initiative at the city level that is now taking young people who are impacted by gun violence out of the city for 30 days and then bringing them back to access jobs, education, health care, behavioral health care, and other services because this is what they've asked for and told us will change the conditions that they are living in. It is important that we treat gun violence as the public health crisis that it is rather than criminalizing and punishing young people for whom we have created disastrous conditions. If we want things to change, we should do something different. Look at cities like Chicago okay. where they've increased policing. Gun yeah. violence has not Thank gone you. down, so we need to do something different. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, same question to you. Talking about the city seeing a spike in gun violence and homicides over the past couple months, the number of people in this neighborhood concerned. How can you ensure the public safety of residents, and what sort of programs or gun control measures do you support? I believe that Nikita has done a lot of work with these organizations, but the fact is it's not working. Gun violence has been going up and up and up. And so I have met with youth, and I have met with people who have been involved in gang violence and have turned their lives around and are now mentoring these youth. I've met and, and actually cried with women who have lost their kids, and they're not coming back. And they're angry that the council doesn't seem to be expressing a, a, an understanding and a, a willingness to do something different. We need to make sure that we're funding the right programs. And there's a lot of good work being, being done out there. I was talking to pastors and, and, and community members, and they want to see some resources spread their way there that are having success. And let's not forget, it's more than just community-driven solutions. Yes, absolutely, that's very, very important. We also need effective law enforcement. And we need to make sure that those two things, community-driven and law enforcement, is coupled. And defunding the police by 50% or abolishing it, as my opponent wants to, is not the right way to go right now when crime of all sorts, and especially gun violence, is on the rise. Nikita, I heard a couple call outs there. Would you like a rebuttal? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I am an abolitionist. I'm also an attorney who works within the system. And I'm well aware that these changes that I believe are the right ones will not happen overnight, and they probably will not happen while I am on council. That doesn't mean that we should not begin building a real public health and safety system that works for everyone. Gun violence is a public health crisis. Reducing and eliminating gun violence demands a public health response. A city, as a city, we can reduce shootings by, and I can give you a these invest in preschool and summer job programs for economically marginalized youth. Fully fund hospital-based intervention so that when young people do have traumatic experiences, we support them and their families immediately. Uh, expand violence interruption programs like the regional peacekeepers. Raise wages and increase access to jobs because that is an anti-violence strategy. And provide gun owners with safe storage equipment and tighten requirements on how you get access to weapons. Please tell me how 12-year-olds are getting access to guns. It's because adults have access to them. And so if we tighten restrictions, we will decrease the number of guns on the streets. Thank you very much for that. I'm gonna move on to position eight, talk a little bit more about this issue. Teresa, I'll start with you. City's seen the spike in gun violence and homicides, as you know, over the past couple months. A lot of people in West Seattle concerned. How can you ensure the public safety of our residents? What sort of programs or gun control measures do you support? Thank you. 
Um, as the mayor has talked about as well, and other mayors across the, the country have talked about, large cities like Seattle are experiencing increased rates of gun violence and interpersonal violence. This is an issue that's plaguing our country. This is another public health crisis. I see gun violence as a true public health issue. I too am endorsed by the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. I have made sure to be on the front lines with firefighters who also want to make sure that we have smart solutions to those who are calling 911 so that when people are in crisis, there is the right person showing up at the right time. Firefighters Local 27 has endorsed me in this race because they know that I am someone who shows up and wants to have short-term solutions and long-term solutions. The, the short-term solutions we've invested in is making sure that firefighters through the Health One mobile vans have now three times the amount of support that they had when I first started. I want to increase that so that we have a Health One van dedicated just out here to West Seattle as well. We, we work to make sure that we provided funding for mental health providers for mental health providers for S Seattle Fire Department as well as the Seattle Police Department. We increase the number of community service officers and mental health crisis team so that people are showing up when you call 911 who don't necessarily have to have a gun. And then we've also made sure that we have reduced gun violence by, as Nikita said, funding $4 million for gun violence reduction programs. That program was cut in the mayor's proposed budget and it is a priority of mine that we increase that funding going forward next year. Thank you. Ken, same question to you. City has seen a spike in gun violence and homicides over the past few months. A lot of people in this area are concerned. How can you ensure the public safety of our residents and what sort of programs or gun control measures do you support? Um, absolutely. Uh, gun violence, just violence in general, so many parts of the safety of our lives have been affected. And so this council in particular has forced challenges that go across these police lines. They have, as a voice, assured that the enforcement of laws was not followed through. So the problem of not enforcing the laws, cutting the police budget, challenging the, actually, Chief Best, who was doing a great job of trying to add more and more staff, each of these items that our council has done directly and specifically to a woman who's worked up through the ranks and was changing the police force, answering and making good steps and strides to do things, those are the problems. We have to go backward and now re-support our police, allow them to hire and incentivize people, incentivize keeping them. How do you keep these people? We always have training and that is always a good thing that we need to add, training. But we need to actually keep good people, allow the police force to in include and expand beyond these, these bounds that it's at, and start enforcing the law. The smaller things that look like nuisances, the graffiti that's going on, the other elements about not encampments, and then their escalation into um, legal challenges. All these are problems that are all based on the council's level to actually provide support for the police, get them a chance forward, and that's what we need to do. It's not about gun control laws, it's about actually solving the criminality. Thank you very much for that. We're gonna move on to a question that our friends at the uh, mosque in High Point helped us develop uh, with regard to kids and families here. And maybe I can start with uh, position nine here. Sarah, I'll start with you. West Seattle is a diverse neighborhood with many different cultures and languages. How do you help families when their children are facing a variety of challenges, from mental health to getting caught up in the legal system? Some parents don't know who to trust, who to communicate with, to deal with these concerns. How would you address this? The, the, the channels of communication between communities and the city, they're broken. They were disbanded. And there is no formal structure really for, for constituencies or community councils or, or people to really access and, and, and seek help and get responses from the city when they dismantled the district council system. And so this is one, we, this what we're seeing is a, um, a lack of access. And so of course every, council, every candidate will say, well, we need better access to marginalized communities that, that, um, that have language barriers and don't know how to navigate the system. That is obvious. But why isn't the city going out and reaching out to these communities themselves? And, 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 and answering emails. What I hear often on the campaign trail is, I have a neighbor who has a problem and I wrote my council member and I did not get a response. Constituent services. And definitely making sure that, that our most vulnerable communities, are, their needs are being met. 
and I don't believe that the council's um, more extremist policies are really helping our most vulnerable, like our communities that have no access to good childcare. Yes, we are we are funding the um, the we expanded preschool, and now we have community colleges. But but do people know about this? Okay. I was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nikita, I'll move this question to you as well. Uh, West Seattle, a diverse neighborhood with many cultures and languages. How do you help families when their children are facing a variety of challenges, from mental health to getting caught up in the legal system? Some parents don't know whom to trust, whom to communicate with, to deal with these concerns. How would you address this? Absolutely. That's actually been my life's work for the last seven years. I've ran an organization called Creative Justice that we built up starting in 2015 from a $200,000 a year organization to a million dollar with our number one priority supporting families and navigating specifically the criminal legal system but also supporting with school exclusion, helping families navigate housing and homelessness crises and find access to sustainable food options. Now for an organization like ours, it takes a lot of advocacy to the Seattle City Council to gain access to resources but you know who doesn't have to fight for their budget every year? Seattle Police Department and the courts, despite the fact that we know by increasing the number of nonprofits that help family and youth navigate systems, we can actually decrease the amount of violence in our city. So I propose increasing the $1 million that is currently in the Office of Civil Rights uh, to $2 million to be able to support more diversion work that helps community organizations coalesce around these strategies. Increasing the money in HSD, the current $13 million to $30 million, to be able to build more infrastructure, community-based infrastructure, to support families that are not just moving through diversion efforts, but need access to other types of de-escalation services when domestic violence happens in your home, because it does, and you need trusted people to help navigate that rather than criminalize that, and increase funding to the Department of Education and Early Learning, uh, and return back our Seattle Youth Employment Program to its full funding that it once was, that young people have access to jobs, counselors, uh, and community case managers who can also support them because parents and kinship care is important, but having a mentor okay. and community can do wonders. Thank you very much for that. I'll head over to position eight here and ask the same question. Ken, I'll start with you. West Seattle, diverse neighborhood, a lot of cultures and languages here. How do you help families when their children are facing a variety of challenges from mental health to getting caught up in the legal system? Some parents don't know whom to trust, whom to communicate with, to deal with these concerns. How would you address this? Yeah, first thing is um, we have to reduce the negative consequences that's happening. Somehow we've created a situation where um, trust and challenges between the government and people that can actually help them, caseworkers, and even the caseworkers themselves with their individual check-ins, how they can follow up and create this. So it's really about framing a problem, identifying what's going on, making a plan, verifying the progress, and actually coming back to it and see that we're getting the things and the services that we're paying for. Right now we have a lot of money that we throw at every problem. Our accountability for that problem is the real problem. So it's not about always having more money, more this, more services. We have provided a lot of services. And there may be issues where we can actually improve upon them, but it's really about actually framing and identifying the problems rightly. And then working with those caseworkers that actually find and identify the steps to get them through it. We can't just leave them in this pool. It is a big challenge to make it through a lot of these situations. And you can imagine adding the diversity and the challenges of language as well. So um, I would welcome the chance to make this more accountable, bring back a system where we actually can make a plan and look at the, the benefits of our service and how we get those people to the right places with the caseworkers. Thank you very much for that. Teresa Mosqueda, the question about the diversity here in West Seattle. How do you help families when their children might be facing a variety of challenges from mental health to getting caught up in the legal system? Some parents don't know whom to trust, whom to communicate with to deal with these concerns. How do you address this? Well, thank you so much for the question. I'm really glad that um, this forum has been brought together to bring in diverse perspectives. I've spent my time on council working with Anila and others from the Muslim Association of Puget Sound to identify solutions to just this question. What we've done together is to help reduce housing instability by investing in making sure more families who are in moments of crisis have a place to call home, that they're not worried about paying their rent month to month. We've increased funding for rent stabilization through the funding that we got from the federal government, and we're gonna to continue to support that and make sure that folks don't get kicked out of their homes if they have language um, barriers, that they have access to legal counsel. We've done that on council. 
I've helped to increase the amount of kiddos who have access to childcare so that families aren't in moments of crisis and their kids can actually have a safe place to go for after school care and childcare so that families can stay at work and be productive members and not be stressed. We've increased access to food security and access to healthier foods in our community um, through the tax that we have on the sugary sweetened beverage tax by making sure that food is accessible in community. I raise these because these are the issues that contribute to the social determinants of health, that help reduce the chance that people are living in stress and poverty, that reduce the chance that people interact with officers in the first place, and make sure that there's greater opportunity for arts and cultural activities. I support like a free wall so people can do graffiti in a beautiful place like the Urban Art Network has asked us for to channel energy and creative um, ideas into kiddos' uh, free time so that they're okay. not in places um, Thank you. creating harm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Folks, I just wanted to remind you that if you'd like to put in a question here, we're going to start asking those in a few minutes. If you want to put up a hand, someone will come around and get you a card, and we can make sure we get those questions in. We're going to try to get in as many as we can here. Um, I'm going to go to another question here that I think is going to be, oh, is there something you wanted to add, Sarah? I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, it occurs to me that we're, nobody's really mentioning one thing that could have prevented a lot of the issues that, that people are concerned about with these families, and that is opportunity. And I do believe that, that uh, access to opportunity and the ability to build generational wealth is key to transformational change and helping immigrants build a life in Seattle. And then, and, and a lot of people, a lot of these families actually work in or own small businesses. And it's time to have someone who is on city council that actually knows that jobs and helping these very small businesses, it actually helps keep communities whole. Foreclosure prevention, making sure that people stay in their homes, direct rent relief, these are some of the upstream um, things that the city can do better so that we aren't worried downstream with the kids that are, um, are, are struggling with mental illness and or law enforcement issues. And so there's a lot more that we can do to help okay. these, mm -hmm. yeah to help these families before it gets to this point. Thank you very much for that. We're gonna move on to another question here that we're gonna make sure we get in before the uh, audience questions come in. Uh, and let's stick with uh, position nine here. Uh, we're talking about uh, public safety and the police. Uh, Nikita, why don't I start with you? What does the phrase defund the police mean to you? After record number of officers leaving the Seattle Police Department, do we need more officers? Do we need more community-based public safety programs? What practices or procedures would you recommend to improve officer recruitment and officer training? A lot going on there. Uh, do, it, do your best in a minute and a half. Uh, defund the police cannot be decoupled from the other strategy, which is invest in black and brown communities. Acknowledging, as Sarah's pointed out, about businesses, a white-owned business is valued at 12 times more than a black-owned business. We have a significant and serious racial wealth gap in our city that needs to be addressed. In 2021, the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform, specializing in reducing incarceration and gun violence, released an analysis of three years of 911 data for the Seattle Police Department, finding that 80% of calls are non-criminal responses, and in the future it would be appropriate for up to 49% of calls to receive an alternative non-sworn response. What that tells me based on data, that is if up to 49% uh, percent of calls can receive another response, then divesting 50% from a system that is not delivering on its promise of public safety and investing that 50% in the responses that will de-escalate, meet people in the crisis they are in, and provide them with access to long-term case management and support is a more significant and more grounded public safety strategy that will get us to a place where rather than being dependent upon an officer with a gun and a badge, we become systems that are built in to skill up all community members to respond and de-escalate when necessary. Additionally, investing in a behavioral health system that the city of Seattle is funding on its own and not dependent upon the King County system will mean that people can receive behavioral health, mental health, and substance abuse supports long before they become a crisis. And that is really what this work is about, preventative, preventing and intervening rather than waiting until a crisis or harm has occurred. Thanks, covered some good ground there, and I know Sarah has some things to say too. Uh, defund the police, what does it mean to you? After a record number of officers have left the Seattle Police Department, do we need more officers? Do we need more community-based public safety programs? What practices or procedures would you recommend to improve officer recruitment or officer training? I haven't heard much 
first disagreement that officers are responding to calls of people in crisis that they're not trained to respond to, and that we need to increase capacity in, in, in social services so that they are not in that position. Fine. But I am extremely concerned about defunding the police anymore at a time, again, of, of rising crime and, and gun violence and, and, and staffing shortage. We heard Adrian Diaz, the chief, say that after that weekend of multiple shootings that people were being deployed all over the city to respond to high response crimes. I know that people in this room ha are, um, have maybe called the police and they have not come when they should have. So with response times so high, I do believe that we need to adequately staff the police. We need also to bring back our community policing model, bring back the, the community policing teams, recruit officers from the, commu the communities that they'll eventually serve. We need to diversify our police force. That's what Carmen Best was trying to do before um, the, the call to defund the police happened. You know, I was talking to, um, uh, the owner of, um, of Arc Lodge Cinemas. It's a, a, he's a black man who owns a business. He's a co-owner in Columbia City. And what he was telling me is he wants the police to come. And he was broken into uh, twice in the last month. And his business partner showed up before the police showed up. Same thing with Island Soul restaurant owner. Okay. Same thing. Okay. This is hurting our people across the city, businesses and residents yep. alike, and we need to put public safety first. Okay. Thanks very much. Would you like to say something, Nikita? Okay. Yeah, so I think it's really important to understand that the city council last year actually fully funded the mayor's uh, staffing proposal. And some of the staffing shortages are actually because officers don't want to get vaccinated. So I think that's important to put in the mix and consider. I also think it's important to know that the 11% defund, which is what it actually amounted to, was civilianizing 911. So we can have uh, civilianized responders who provide a multitude of options to people when they're in crisis so that when they call, they receive exactly what they need. Uh, the other portion was moving parking enforcement into the Seattle Department of Transportation, acknowledging that parking enforcement has no place necessarily being in a, in a criminal or punitive system and should be moved to a different place to ensure that rather than always having to have an officer doing the flag waving or always having an officer uh, checking did you park your car right when you call around an issue around parking? We'd actually be better off having folks that are civilianized responding to those. There's also state level changes that need to be made to ensure that we have the right responses at the right time. And I have state level endorsements who are willing to partner with us to build on the work of 2020 to ensure that we have a public safety system that works for everyone. Thanks very much for that. I want to make sure that we're hearing from position eight on this. Teresa, I'll start with you. What does the phrase defund the police mean to you? After a record number of officers have left the Seattle Police Department, do we need more officers? Do we need more community-based public safety programs? What practices or procedures would you recommend to improve officer recruitment and officer training? Okay, so even before last year's moment of racial reckoning, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, in the wake of Breonna Taylor's murder, in, even in the wake of uh, Charlena Lyle's murder here in Seattle, officers have been telling me, we have been asked to do too much. We shouldn't be the people who are showing up when folks need a case manager. I cannot be somebody's mental health counselor. I don't want to act as the person who is the ambulance to Harborview when what folks need is health services. Officers themselves have said we've asked too much of them and what we ought to be doing is thinking about somebody else to show up to those calls. That's what officers and frontline first responders have told me directly. Yes, we have seen a decrease in the number of officers in Seattle, similar to cities across this country. And part of the, I think, uh, grounding that I want to give us is that it's not actually 300 officers that are out of circulation right now. In a presentation in my committee, in the budget committee, um, just last week, they talked about when you look at the number of people that are on leave right now and the number of officers that are usually in circulation, we are down about 98 officers. But we are trying to balance that out with making sure that there is the right person to call for mental health counseling, case management, housing connectors. I have funded those. We have increased um, Health One. We have increased the community service officer program. It is in existence. And we have now civilianized the 911 call center through the leadership of Councilmember Herbold, in addition to making sure that we are looking at other alternative community and city-run resources okay. to show up. That's what I hope we can continue to work on. Thanks very much for that. Ken, going to you on this one, what does the phrase defund the police mean to you? After a record number of officers have left the Seattle Police Department, do we need more officers? Do we need more community-based public safety programs? What practices or procedures would you recommend to improve officer recruitment and officer training? Absolutely, we need more officers. 
You look at public safety, this is the worst on record. You look at number of shootings haven't increased. You look at even the response Chief Diaz gave to the Seattle Times. I know where the problems are. I don't have anyone to send to them. You hear other candidates today talk about the response time, the challenges going on there. What happened to those businesses? There's real crime and real problems happening. This is not about moving the parking division or something like that. There's real police that are, are missing. The other thing, I've talked with 9 retired 911 um, personnel. I've talked with the president of the police guild. I've talked with the police as well. What they're saying is that no, no, the detectives, everything in the back office, that's why these non-emergency calls go to a machine and half the machines are full. Have you ever called and said, oh, we're not taking additional calls? That's, that's on the, the blogs in every part of our city, up there in Wallingford for me too. So there's something really wrong and to pretend that no, it's, it's not a problem, it is a problem. We can't defund the police, we need to build back. How do we do that? First off, we have to start engaging the police correctly. The city of Seattle, our council, separate, wasn't even talking to them in, during that challenge. I will not be that kind of person. I will talk with them and work with them to come to a solution that makes sense for all of us. If we do have a difference that needs to be worked through, you can't do it by pushing them out of the room. They need to be in the room with you. So it's about actually communicating, working with them to de-escalate and do the good things that they already do as good okay. things. All right, thanks very much. Uh, we've got some questions that have come in from the audience, and I know we're not going to be able to get to all these, but I'm going to try to put them out there. Everybody, if you could try to keep your answer to a minute uh, or less, if you'd like. I want to try to cover some ground here. Uh, how about this? Uh, Nikita, I'll start with you, and we'll just go down the line here. Here's one. The uh, neighborhood of High Point wants more patrolling in their neighborhood. They want 24-hour patrolling, but a patrolling team that has probable and thorough training, a patrolling team that is trained to de-escalate situations and know how to properly call the de correct department needed. Um, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I don't think it needs to be armed officers. We have the Peace and Safety Initiative, the Regional Peacekeepers, all of whom come to community events and have the skills, they're trained to do de-escalation work. I think we really need to understand what our own 911 data says, which 49% of calls can receive a non-sworn alternative response. That is key, this is a data-driven and a data-based decision. I know people will try to make um, the defund movement sound like it came out of nowhere, but it literally came out of SPD's own 911 data. Uh, affirmatively telling us that having a response that could be people walking through your neighborhood, like the Corner Graders Project and the Rainier Beach neighborhood, which helps significantly decrease activity and hot spots that have been identified again by data from the Seattle Police Department in partnerships with George Washington University. Thank you very much for that. Sarah, any thoughts about this? Is that question meaning a, a private security? Um, it doesn't say that specifically. It says a patrolling team that's trained to de-escalate situations and know how to properly call the correct department needed. So I guess there's some room for interpretation there, well, but it, it's, okay. please. So it's clear that people do not feel safe. If you're calling for a 24 hour patrol, that is a bad sign that our system has been, um, our public safety system is broken. Are you, oh, okay, you're, okay, he's, okay. He's got it. Hold on. So I've heard a lot of aspirational things about 50% um, of these calls don't require a, a police response. How do you know that? You can't just cut the police by 50%, which is what the um, solidarity budget is calling for now, without a plan for keeping, keeping people safe, without a plan for who is going to come to your house when you're getting broken into, or when a fight breaks out at this, um, in this area and cops are necessary. And so we have got to make sure that my, well, my opponent tweeted, want to end violence and poverty. Yes, but what are we doing today? And I believe we do need to prioritize public safety because this, this question that was generated here, mm -hmm. people are thinking about that all over the city. Uh, Nikita, got room for one more rebuttal from you? <clears throat> I think it is absolutely irresponsible to fear monger. 2% of calls that come into Seattle Police Department are ones that are categorized as violent or felonies, according to its own, their own data. And fear mongering sounds a lot like the 1980s tough on crime era, which did not increase safety. In fact, it put half of the people in prison during that era were black people. 
and it did not make our community safer, nor did it stop the drug trade, nor did it stop gun violence. We need to stop doing tactics that we know do not work. We do have a plan. It's invested, investing in community-based organizations. It's scaling up community-based response. It's investing in de-escalation training. It's providing peer navigators and case managers in every neighborhood. It's decentralizing housing and homelessness services. It's getting people housed. The number one determinant of safety is housing. And in a region that has a housing affordability and homelessness crisis, we're going to see upticks in violence and a lack of safety. This city has a, uh, an obligation to respond to those crises in a way that are based in a public health strategy and a public health lens, not repeating history from the 80s and 90s that have harmed black communities. Got it. Uh, Ken, this idea of a neighborhood patrol, uh, uh, some of these people want a 24-hour patrol. Your thoughts about that? I, I absolutely agree that we should start having patrols, but we should actually be doing these patrols correctly with the police. And so this concept that you don't need a police officer to show up, there is a non-emergency call number. 911 calls, it may turn out that there was no, no weapon involved. It may turn out positively so that 2% could have. We don't know that. What, how do you know the mental state of someone that broke into your house? How do you know if they have a weapon? You need an officer, you need a level of force to show up, and then they can help assist you with the other challenges that, okay, it's just someone that need a place to sleep, so this is a mental issue, okay, good, good. To start with the idea that we don't need police because they don't have to show up is just 100% wrong. And if you use statistics incorrectly, which I'm, I'm good at math, then you're gonna come to the wrong result. The safety problems we see in our city today is about coming to the wrong result. You don't know what you're approaching. You need the police to show up and get ready. Uh, Teresa, this idea of 24-hour patrols, people asking for that in this High Point neighborhood. Thank you. Ken, you are using statistics inappropriately. That's not the statistic. The numbers come from the Seattle Police Department folks where we've had now three analysis of 911 calls. The data from SPD and the mayor's analysis show that 80% of the calls that are coming to Seattle Police Department are not criminal in nature. That means the break-in example that was just given is part of the other 20%. We want to focus our efforts on how to get someone to show up to those non-criminal in nature calls. Part of the solution is what we did last year, $13 million into human service contracts for, for community safety, $30 million supported by the mayor for the task force recommendations that she put out have been funded. We've increased the community service officers and the peace and safety initiative efforts that Nikita mentioned, non-armed officers who are trained in de-escalation and know the number to call. And part of what I'd like to offer as well is additional solutions to create greater safe communities by increasing lighting with Seattle City Light, which I have helped to do and we can do more of it, and activate our space for kiddos to have places to go and play yep. and be in safe community around their home. Can I get room for one more rebuttal? This, go this ahead. This is my final rebuttal. Please. And, um, yep. I'll, I'll keep it brief because um, I know we've changed gears here. So most importantly, Come back to what this is all about. It's about public safety and how people are perceiving and feeling actual activity. If you allow the escalation that's going on by the criminals knowing there will be no enforcement, then you have allowed no enforcement even to go beyond that and have allowed the escalation in shootings that we're seeing. So these statements that, oh, these were somewhere else, that, that isn't correct. Think about what, what and how you feel now and yet let that understand what you should actually be doing. We need to think about this better. There is a plan. We need to understand, frame it, and fix it. Okay, I'm gonna to try to move on to another question here. Uh, Nikki, uh, how about Ken? I'll start with you, we'll go back that way. How about this? What experience do you have in helping with childcare assistance? The Seattle Solidarity Budget recommends investing over $17 million in childcare access. Um, so uh, my, my wife was on the board of Northwest Family um, Care Center for probably 10 years, and as we had, and even after our kids left. So these are very important issues. And of course, I got two daughters, two great daughters that have grown up very successfully, one's 16, one's 22. But so the, these are real issues, and I understand it. I was in that same process, sharing that means of how to find proper care, how to evaluate, determine what we are or what we need and what's beneficial to our kids. I think this is an individual level. We still have to go back to the process and allow families to do what they need to do to decide, oh, this is the care that we need. To kind of 
almost socialize this and say the government's going to provide that. It's going to take out a lot of the benefits of what we're doing as families. And so I don't support that kind of work. Got it. Uh, Teresa, your experience in helping with child care assistance, the Seattle Solidarity Budget recommends investing over $17 million in child care access. Um, thank you so much. So my background is in public health. I worked at the Department of Health at the state level. I've worked at CMAR Community Health Centers. And everyone knows that our health and well-being actually is influenced by our years zero to three. The best thing that we can do for kiddos and the health of our population is make sure that they have a safe place to go for their health and well-being and for their learning. That's why I've invested so much of our time and energy into creating safe places for kiddos to go. Prior to the pandemic, we were already in a child care desert here in Seattle, especially for infants to three. What I have done is increase the amount of capital dollars to create new child care facilities and home-based facilities through SEIU 925, who supports home-based providers, to create more opportunities around our city. We've now invested $5 million in capital dollars through the rescue, rescue Plan and $3 million to support providers directly to honor and respect the work that they've done, especially during COVID. We have a opportunity now with the Build Back Better uh, Rescue Plan Act in D.C. That is why Senator Murray called me last Thursday to stand with her to call for the passage of okay. both infrastructure bills together. Okay. Infrastructure is about kiddos care, too. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, Sarah, let's talk about child care assistance. The Seattle, Seattle Solidarity Budget, talking about this $17 million investment. Your thoughts on child care, please. Sure, I think child care is a good thing. I think that we should be offering child care to, uh, to kids younger than, than preschool. That's good practice, but where is that money going to come from? The, uh, the Solidarity Budget calls for the, um, the just... Uh, defunding the municipal court. The solidarity budget calls for 90 million um, in participatory budgeting. The solidarity budget calls for taking money away from the city attorney's office and defunding the police by 50%. Policy is a, is, is a whole bunch of trade-offs. And you need to know when you want to fund one thing, where is that money going to come from? I will not just sort of say, yeah, of course, great idea, without understanding what are the, what are, where's that money coming from, and, and how many kids will be served, etc. That is how you make good policy. Because here we are saying, of course, who is going to say, no, I don't think uh, more child care okay. is a good thing. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Uh, Nikita, your experience in helping with child care assistance, the Seattle Solidarity Budget, talking about this $17 million investment. So I want to start first by saying Sarah keeps acting like Solidarity Budget is mine. I did not write it. My organization did sign on to it, as did a hundred other organizations in our city, from transportation to health care to Green New Deal to community-based orgs that do violence intervention work. I mean, it is hundreds of people, so please go look it out. Um, child care is basic infrastructure. I worked as a child care worker for $10 an hour, y'all. We need to pay our child care workers more, and we need to treat it as a basic necessity, just like roads, uh, transportation, and uh, municipal broadband. We learned during the pandemic that child care is a necessity. So three pillars. Build child care in every neighborhood so people have access to it close to home. Ensure child care is affordable for every family and economic stability for child care workers by having portable benefits and providing contracts that have enough money for them to get a prevailing wage. The last thing I would say is yes, the budget is a trade-off. And the one areas that really ever have to trade off happens to be Seattle Municipal Court, the city attorney's office, and the police department. And I think that for a better infrastructure and public safety okay. system, we should consider that okay. as a place to make a trade. Thank you very much. I want to to squeeze in one last question from the audience here because they've been so patient they put in a lot of questions I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all but uh, four candidates answering you see what we got here uh, Nikita I'll start with you and come on down uh, this is all how we're gonna be friends uh, at the end of this thing listen to this one uh, many public service efforts and programs require cooperation among public offices if elected what will be your approach to getting cooperation from other government officials on core projects during your term Nikita Absolutely. I am a community organizer. Yes, I am also an activist. I am also an attorney, but you do not fund and run an organization without being able to build partnerships. And because of the partnerships we've been able to build, we've launched programs like the Restorative Community Pathways at the King County level that is now a program that has $6 million to divert young people out of the school to prison pipeline and into services. That is the kind of work I intend to continue to do. I'm endorsed by environmental orgs, by federal, state, 
uh, county and city legislators. I am endorsed by community members such as Coach Dominique Davis and Sean Good. I am also endorsed by business owners uh, like the business owners at the station who know that I understand that small businesses matter, but also that black and brown small businesses do not receive the same capital or support that white businesses do, and that's why they're 12 times High, more highly valued. Reality is I will also show up in spaces where I am uncomfortable. Sarah refused to show up to the Real Change Vendors event to be able to have a conversation together with those vendors, but I have shown up to business associations okay. where I know they're not favorable to my responses, but All I right. will still be there for conversation. Sarah, let's talk about cooperation. What would be your approach to getting cooperation from other government officials on core projects during your term if you're elected? Yeah, I worked for Councilmember Richard Khan when he was president of City Council, and um, that was back when Council was a little bit more of a functioning body. What he did that was different is he went and talked to um, our delegation in Washington, and he reached out to the mayor and, and council members in Spokane, and 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 spoke and and formed relationships with the mayors and council members of our suburban cities to help to bridge the um, the elephant, which Seattle is sometimes considered, and and really come together on priorities in in Olympia. And so I believe that it's about relationship building. You have to be aware that people have different agendas, but you have got to form those relationships with other governmental entities. And Seattle doesn't have a great reputation right now. And so if I am elected, what I will do is I will talk to our delegation in Olympia before assuming uh, office and find out what bills do you want Seattle to support? That's not happening. Okay. So we need to be in lockstep with our delegation and make sure that we're, we're on the same page. Thank you very much for that. Teresa, this question, if elected, what would be your approach to getting cooperation from other government officials on core projects during your term? Um, well, I'm doing that. That is happening. That's part of the reason why I had the opportunity to stand with Senator Murray in the call for the Build Back Better Act along with the Capital Infrastructure Bill so that we can show how important it is that those dollars come directly to our city for housing, for child care, for small business support. I have built relationships over my 20 years of work, and that is why I have Representative Jayapal's endorsement, Dow Constantine's endorsement, Bob Ferguson's endorsement, and I know the importance of working with the executive branch and making sure that the legislative branch and executive branch, the council and the mayor, can find common ground, but also have respect for each of those roles. That's why I've been endorsed by former mayors Mike McGinn and former mayor um, Charles Roy Royer. That's because they know that I'm somebody who's progressive but knows how to work with people to deliver on it. That's what you saw me do with Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax, a large payroll tax on our largest businesses who have done so well under this pandemic. Okay. We want to make sure that we can work together and that's what I've done. Uh, Ken, question to you, if elected, what would your approach be to getting cooperation from other government officials or core pro on core projects during your term? Yeah, and um, team building starts with not excluding others that don't have the same voice from the room with you. So it's really about actually pulling these people together and actually hearing them. And quite frankly, us as an administrator of your city budget, your city activities, is a voice for you. So we need to bring back our opportunities to meet with these individuals in places like this where we can actually hold council, council and get that back and forth dialogue so we have informed decisions. But getting these team building together is about also getting the government officials that you don't always understand or on the same page with. And so how can we understand this better? Defining the problem, verifying that we're getting a solution. Is it working? Let's change it. So always progress, working through the steps, and I think everyone can see that when you're working together, you're gonna actually get that system without excluding as we have seen in the past. Okay, thanks for that. It's closing statement time. We're gonna switch it up, so position nine will go first, and then position eight. Uh, Nikita, you will speak first, and Sarah, you'll have the last word. I actually speak second, I went first. I'm sorry? I went first. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm gonna do that again so that Sarah gets the last word. I thought you said the person who goes first goes last. Uh, when you introduce us. But it's fine. Okay. Go. <laughs> I'm going to stand up because I'm tired of sitting. First of all, thank you so much for having us here in your space, the opportunity to speak with you and share with you our ideas. 
I am committed to building a city that is safe, inviting, and welcoming for everyone. A city that is willing to live up to our race and social justice initiative and the goals that we put forward for ourselves. A city that puts progressive revenue in place because we know our regressive tax system is brittle and it will continue to build its budget on the backs of those who have the least while there is great wealth within our city. I'm committed to addressing the housing affordability and homelessness crisis through building, acquisition, preservation, and ensuring that all of our residents without homes have access to the supports and services that honor their human dignity and decision to decide where they want to be in the long run. And I believe that together we can build a city that in 50 years from now has addressed the climate catastrophe and has responded to our climate goals through density, building housing, a transportation system for all, and preserving our urban tree canopy. I'm endorsed by many organizations, including our MLK Labor Council, and I look forward to partnering and working with you all. Thank you. Sarah, you'll have a chance to make a closing statement. Sarah has kept one of her rebuttals, so she's gonna have a couple of minutes here is what we're gonna do. Go ahead, go right ahead. Council's empty rhetoric and failed policies are not working, they're not helping the most vulnerable, and my opponent offers more of the same. Defund the police. Progressive revenue without a plan for how to spend that revenue. And, 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 and aspirational goals, yes, but what are we going to do today? This council lacks plans, and, uh, and, and that's why we've gotten into this problem. So um, I want you to know, if you, if you don't remember anything from tonight, that there is an antidote to the dysfunction that, that we've been seeing for the past four years. The stakes are high this election, and the contrast is clear, and you've heard many differences of opinion. I believe that we need to help small businesses. We need to actually reach out to communities and ask, what do you need? Is it working for you? And if not, what can we do better? And that's what I have been doing this whole um, campaign long. But I also have a diversity of, um, of endorsements that speaks to the fact that there are folks that want a change and they include Seattle Times, the firefighters, the Building and Construction Trades Council, the iron workers, the plumbers and pipe fitters, and, and IBEU, w, IBW, um, 66 and, and uh, no, excuse me, 46 and 77. And Gary Locke, and Dan Evans, and Ruben Carlisle, and Gail Tarleton, and the whole suite of most of the old city council members, environmental leaders, police reform leaders, um, Harriet Walden and Victoria Beach. And so what this shows is that they see me as the best shot to make a difference, to really get this city back on track, to make Seattle a safe and livable city again. Thank you very much and check out my website and learn more. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Teresa, you'll go first and then Ken, you'll get the last word in your race. Well, neighbors, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here uh, with you tonight. This is the first chance we've had an opportunity to do a forum in person, so it's really wonderful to be looking at you and see your faces and see so many familiar faces as well. I am very much aware of the crises that are facing our city. I see the number of folks who are living outside and the folks who need housing on a daily basis, just like you. I am asking to come back to council because I know when we implement the funding from Jumpstart Progressive Seattle, $135 million a year, we're going to build the affordable housing so that more people can get into housing and get into shelter. I have so much appreciation for all we've been able to do in the last four years. We are on the national stage for good reasons related to labor standards, national attention for the bill that I passed for Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights, national attention on the hotel worker legislation, national attention on what we're trying to do around housing. That's why I and Mayor Bowser from D.C. sat on a task force from the League of Cities. I hope to continue to do more with you, and I know how pressing the urgency is. All right. Can you get the last word? Uh, thanks very much. And and I reiterate that. Thank you very much for having us in person. Um, Ballard Alliance did do the same, and it's really special to actually come to the people and really important to do that. Um, but I'm a different kind of candidate, and I hope you can take that from what you've heard, what you see about me, but I'm back to running the business of a city. This is a world-class city. There is no reason we should be seeing the safety issues, homeless issues. You know, the challenges with graffiti and, and so many other problems. Our bridges are closed. Seattle needs a council member like me, one that protects our great infrastructure, protects our great city, understands and knows how to run a good city. 
So as a small business owner and engineer, I'm used to tackling these hard problems and I will find solutions to homeless, protecting our tree canopy, and providing lasting support for our, our police and our public safety. What I need from you is your vote, and I humbly ask for your consideration. All right, thank Thanks you very you. much for that. Can we give all of our candidates a big round of applause, please? Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. A big thanks, of course, to the League of Women Voters, the High Point Mosque, Our Lady of Guadalupe for putting this event together. My name is Brian Callanan. It's been a pleasure to moderate this. I know the candidates will probably stick around for a minute and a half or so, and if you'd like to ask them some questions, you may. But I know also they are busy people, too, so please be respectful of their time. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good night.